Welcome to another edition of Regulatory Ramblings. Our guest today is Abhishek Bali, CEO and co-founder of Zigram, based in Gurgaon, India. Gurgaon is a satellite town to the nation's capital, Delhi. With over 15 years of ex expertise in AML, financial crime compliance, data assets, and third-party risk, Abhishek has worked on engagements and initiatives across the globe, while collaborating with firms such as KPMG, Dun & Bradstreet, BMR Advisors, and India's very own Access Bank. He leads various business initiatives and data solutions, leverage machine learning, artificial intelligence, data assets, and deep technology applications to solve real world problems pertaining to risk. Products and technologies developed by Abhishek and his firm uh, aim to solve problems in the areas that are in the space of politically exposed persons, AML know your customer, due diligence, adverse media, country watch list, sanctions, cannabis businesses increasingly in modern times, as well as high risk individuals and entity monitoring. Abhishek is a ACAM certified professional, the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialist, for those of you wondering what that acronym and credential is all about. And he's also the co-chair of the India chapter of ACF. CS, which is the Association of Certified Financial Crime Specialists. He's going to talk to us today about the state of AML and financial crime compliance in India and the use of AI and machine learning in the mix. I should also point out that Abhishek's company puts out the weekly AML penalties bulletin, as well as the risk and reg tech roundup. These are newsletters that are focused on the latest insights and news and risk ML, regulatory technology, and FCC. And uh, if you can get on their list, um, I strongly encourage you to do so. So with that, Abhishek, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ajay. Much, much appreciated. Thank you for making time. Um, how would you rate the current state of AML and financial crime compliance awareness in India and also the overall state of compliance, because I mean, you, you've been in the business a long time and I've been covering this a long time. I think we both know how well your country gets a score from the FATF, or, you know, the mutual evaluations, the overall grade you get for the state of compliance in your society, even if you get a good score, has nothing to do with the level of illicit funds sloshing around in your society. So with that realistic perspective in mind, what, what, what is the state of awareness and what is the state of compliance in India? There has been a massive change in the outlook to this, to money laundering as a problem over the last 10 years. I mean, really, really stems from that. Uh, if you look at the expectations of an organization, I think every every uh, uh, policy document out there, every regulation out there talks about the fact that the tone at the top and culture within the organization to talk about uh, needs to be aligned to anti-money laundering norms. And that is equally true even for a country. It's It starts there, the tone at the top and the culture of, of accepting if there is an issue when it comes to AML or financial crimes is very critical before we can even go down to what the regulations are, are the agencies being proactive, yes or no. And I think that has been, I think, a visible change over the last 10 years. Uh, and I think it also has to do with the fact that um, connected to money laundering, the countries had issues with when it comes to terrorism, when it comes to drugs, when it comes to tax evasion, when it comes to... Um, just old school laundering money, corruption. And those have been, the realization of those being problems has been a big driver for the government and the regulatory bodies to start getting their act together. Now, have they gotten to a great place? I'd probably say no. Uh, they're not in a great place, but I, we definitely see an acceleration of changes. So for example, just a few days back, a couple of weeks back, uh, the AML norms were modified and changed to also include uh, DNFPBs, which is designated non-financial persons and businesses, which includes accountants and lawyers um, and brokers and other people, which is a very progressive step, not taken by many other countries as well. 
so i think things are changing uh, but we have um, and and it's good to see the tone at the top change but we have a long ways to go as can be evidenced by the quantum of fines that are put on banks in india so unlike the us and uk and many parts of the world where the quantum of fines can sometimes cross a billions of dollars uh, i think the maximum that i have ever heard of uh, in india has not maybe crossed 500 600000 um so uh, you know financial penalty isn't a, isn't a real deterrent here no that that's 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 a fair point and um i i know you pointed out to me once that in terms of act aml actions by government by regulators india is only third behind the us and the uk in terms of number of actions obviously the fines are a lot lower um i mean some years back this was in 2017 Bank of India's Hong was it Bank of India or State Bank of India their Hong Kong branch uh was fined a million US right like came in and that was for you know glaring breaches of the local anti money laundering ordinance that had accrued over a number of years and so action needed to be taken but yeah pe- people don't uh people don't appreciate that um that i mean uh, severe actions have been taken in india and, and uh even though the fines um are not not perhaps as 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 high um I want to come back to some, something you said which, which which was that the level of awareness has grown i i have to query though did did demonetization help I mean, that is to say the modi administration's actions they certainly help propel india into a digital age in terms of payments but the demonetization help in terms the actions they took uh in early november 2016 when the world was focused on the us election and the election of trump and at that time he chose to basically cut cut out large denomination bills from the system uh you had a certain period of time to deposit or, or, or you know or give them the right. and did, did that help i think that that question is still debated because uh in terms you know, of AML, in terms of aml did it help yeah in in terms of aml as well i mean uh, it is debated not because uh you know it whether it was a failure or whether it was a success but it had positive it had positive byproducts we must concede it yes. had positive byproducts for the society but it seems to me that if you looked at at the time it wasn't people in the middle or upper classes lining up outside of atms it was workers it was laborers it was women in saris you know it was uh pe- people living hand to mouth or you know it's a sustenance level um my sense is that those in the know had a feeling it was coming and they tend to keep a good chunk of their assets in more stable currencies in that sense money laundering can continue in those currencies so i think uh, the reason why we are sorry about that the reason why uh, we are still debating i think the efficacy of um or, or the output of the by product maybe, maybe it's too soon maybe it's too mm-hmm. soon it hasn't been a decade yet i think yes so that's exactly what i was coming to because a lot of the policy and macro changes that governments end up doing um usually end up showing uh i'd say validated outcomes which have been which can be validated independently by researchers by institutes by by journalists by others uh, i think over over longer periods periods of time so i wouldn't i definitely am not uh, personally and this is me personally i'm one of those people who will you know look at a large momentous change and and uh, and assess its uh, positives or negatives just over a 3 to 5 year period because often 
you can see the benefits or the negative impacts of it over larger spans of time. So when it comes to demonetization, I think I'll, I can tell you a couple of positive things that, that have happened. One is one is connected to the way in, uh, to the same thing that you've spoken about when it comes to digital the digital push. I think with digital push, a lot of acceptance at the government level and at the organizational level of having digital tools has been a byproduct of that, which means better transaction monitoring, better screening, uh, better uh, sort of KYC, just the basics, which was which was even until five years ago, six years ago was done manually in many cases. So I think that's that's been a big change. That is one. Second is I think uh, when it comes to um, the amount of uh, uh, you know many of the agencies have sort of gotten together and looked at where is it that a lot of the cash was coming into the uh, was sort of getting spent, and uh, from our understanding, that has enabled a number of agencies to also then look at potential tax offenders and others where there has been a lot of. Uh, clamping down of that, and in addition to the new GST, uh, I think uh, the, the sort of norms that have come into play, which is more goods and services tax, which is more, uh, which is across the country, um, that has helped sort of plug some of the loopholes. But that being said, uh, I think direct and explicit advantages related to uh, to anti money laundering connected to demonetization. I think we'll we'll still have to wait a few years before we can definitively say what those are. Yeah, I guess you have to look at the long-term data sets, which is something you're heavily concerned with. And, and uh, beyond that, it takes longer to change a country of a billion people. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah, you've shared with me in the past that when we look at most of the existing players, most of the big AML, reg tech solutions providers and data providers in the world, the Oftentimes, they're only targeting the world's biggest banks and financial institutions. So if we look at, say, the figure you gave me was 175,000 global financial institutions, you know, around the world. Most only focus, most solutions providers only focus on the top 500. And even then, they're really only aggressively pursuing the top 100. Absolutely. Institutions. And obviously, that, that makes sense, deep pockets. They have the money to spend on such solutions. But the upshot, unfortunately, is there's a long, as you put it, there's a long tail of underserved institutions not being serviced by fintech and regtech integrated service providers. So uh, tell me more about that long tail of sure. unserved institutions who aren't being tended to by service providers. What What is a... What is the consequence of that? That these institutions will buy off-the-shelf solutions, presumably they'll customize them for their needs, and that'll be that. So, what 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 what's the issue? What 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 sure. why 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 is this such an issue? I think the reason why it is an issue is because um, when we talk about the big banks and the big big logos uh, at the media level. Culturally, in in public, um, I'd say uh, top of mind recall, or even regulatory top of mind recall, we only think about the big players. And uh, when it comes to even if you look at regulatory fines, even if you look at the big fines, and you look at the long tail of fines, you see that most of the focus and most of the fines and most of the penalties actually happen to the big names. Right. Uh, right. And and not the smaller ones, presumably because unlike the more uh, unlike say the Asian way generally, and I'm this is a very broad stroke, but the Asian way of dealing with non-compliance, which is a strict uh, you know flat fee, uh, flat penalty, or a flat um, fine or imprisonment. In, in the West, it's more, you know, you can negotiate those things uh, to a certain dollar value. So you often go with, uh, you often go with larger, you know, you often, uh, regulators also want to go after the larger sort of fish in that sense. So a lot of focus is there, big, the big vendors want to go there, they are, it's more viable to sort of sell to them, the ticket size is better. And I think the issue therefore is, 
when we spoke about that 175000 number those are not all institutions those are institutions of a certain size so there will be medium enterprises and above they're not small and micro right. because small and micro are your mom and pop shops the you know single counter forex uh, uh, institutions small loan providers others they're also financial institutions you know that are there in every nook and cranny of every street in asia the uh, you know especially across asia and I think the challenge is that where much of the money laundering issues initially start, where they begin, is really uh, at the long tail. And they don't have solutions. They don't have technology solutions to comply. And if they don't have technology solutions to comply, their only other option is to just not comply, which is exactly what they're doing right now. And I think that is the challenge. That is essentially the challenge of the long tail. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's... That's unfortunate. So, with that in mind, why is reg tech needed in India? So, reg tech is needed in India because, uh, unlike in the, unlike in say some of the developed parts of the world, per transaction per account values are high, and therefore you can spend a proportion of that that money to comply. So, if Per account, per transaction, per uh, customer, you're making, you know, a higher value as compared to, say, the developing world. It means that per customer, per document, uh, you know, you can only spend that much lesser. But the compliance requirements, the bar for compliance is just going up across countries. It's going up. It's stringent. Now, uh, for the longest time. Uh, as we can see in some of the cases, for example, HSBC, for example, Credit Suisse and others, the way they solved some of the issues on remediation, some of the issues on, on, on KYC, some of the issues on documentation, was that, was that they got armies of people to sit down, go through the documentations, process them, uh, do the KYC, do the checks and do that. And that's the reason why is because they make a lot of money. They make, make a lot of margin. That is not the case in most countries in Asia, Africa. Uh, Southeast Asia, um, you know, even Western Europe or even South America. And so you need technology. You need technology to be to be able to process them in a scalable, cost-effective manner to comply. Because we can't add in people going forward. You know, the salaries are going uh, off uh, completely, you know, at about 10, 15% year on year. You can't manage that cost. And I think that's really where RegTech is very important. It's interesting you say that because, I mean, when I talk to the bankers, um, there is a fair amount of grousing. There is a fair amount of gr uh, grumbling and cribbing because the feeling is, who are these people not being paid, not in substantial amounts of money, for what is essentially an oversight role? Right. So at some point, that growth in compliance is, is going to reach a point of diminishing returns. Okay, so there's been an explosion in regulatory oversight in India. There's been an explosion in the growth of fintech, regtech, uh, wealth tech, insure tech, and to an extent legal tech. Um, is that what's pushing regtech adoption in India, the greater regulatory oversight and just greater uptake of technology, or is it is it something else? Is it is, I mean, or is, is, is this just a matter of utilization reflects need or are people trying to be ahead of the curve? So in, in every business, there are two elements. You either reduce costs or you increase revenues. When we talk about compliance or regulation, the main driver is reducing cost. It's, uh, and so when we look at reducing cost, the challenge is, that in India, the number of transactions, the number of customers are mind boggling. Correct. I mean, even a small institution will have, you know, can have at least can have 10 to 15 million customers, relatively small institution. And so you've got hundreds and thousands of transactions, but these are micro transactions, like 100 rupees, 200 rupees, a couple of dollars at max. So the challenge, therefore, that ends up becoming is uh, how do I keep my costs in check? while doing business in a high velocity environment where I don't make the kind of margin that I'm used to. 
And I think that's where the adoption of RegTech is coming in. There's regulatory pushes definitely there, but you're trying to keep your costs low. And the only way to now in the modern world to keep your costs low when it comes to compliance is to adopt a technology first approach, which is why RegTech. There is, uh, you know, you can't get cheaper manpower anymore. There is no offshoring that India can do. There was a lot of outsourcing that you can do when you're in the US to India, but there is no outsourcing that you can do from India to anywhere else. Um, uh, you know, at, at the scale that you would want to, to kind of keep your costs low. And I think so that is the challenge. Well, I mean, you are talking about skilled labor mm. and okay, India's labor costs are perhaps more manageable than what we see in mainland China, but for sure, um, the, the, there are limits to how much you can say with, with such trained stuff. I think, okay, we know jurisdictions pay attention to neighboring jurisdictions in terms of their, their developments. And in India, you can't look at really the Indian economy in isolation from the UAE economy, certainly Dubai. So based on what you told me about red tech adoption in India, what about what we see in the GCC and rising financial hubs like Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Doha and their uptake of such technologies and their burgeoning fintech crypto scene? And what does that mean in terms of the risks and threats to that process for uh, AML and financial crime compliance in India. Because, because both, if you're coming from one jurisdiction and entering the other, Dubai to Mumbai, or Mumbai to Dubai, you get a higher risk weighting in terms of a bank's profiling because of the history of hot cash going back and forth between the two. Yeah. So I would say this, first of all, uh, you know, when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, just the, just the, the kind of risks that there are. Yeah. I think even when you look at the FATF gray list, the UAE is part of the gray list. Uh, and the big reason for that is not the banks. The big reason for that is not, uh, not because of their big financial institutions. The big reason, at least as per the report of FIT, if I remember correctly, is because of the DNFPBs, which is the uh, which is the designated non-financial persons and businesses, specifically real estate and gold. Correct. And we have seen, uh, at least there are documented instances of where, because of the Russia-Ukraine um, uh, conflict, ongoing conflict, it is, uh, you know, there is some evidence that maybe some of the money is flowing to Dubai uh, and to the UAE for, uh, because of, into real estate. Now, again, uh, this is not research that I have done. This is basically that. And I see when I look at the middle, when I look at the UAE, the UAE has become this uh, very progressive, business-friendly, uh, investor-friendly space. On the surface, yes. On the surface. But those the the issues that I, for example, mentioned, whether it is you know money coming in from say Russia or money coming in from other parts of the world, which is sort of uh, and there's a lot of money that's gone in from India into the into uh, the UAE over just over the last couple of years. In fact, by some estimates, they say more money has been invested in by high net worth individuals in the UAE from India than they have invested in India. Uh, because of because of the kind of returns that they're getting and because of, I think, some regulatory, lax regulatory oversight. So we see that, I think, as a concern. Uh, but then again, uh, I think it's very exciting to see the kind of fintech growth that is there in, in the Middle East right now. Um, and a lot of the rectech solutions are in demand over there. I think they're definitely trying to be progressive. They're trying to get themselves out of the gray list, which is good news for everyone. Uh, it may take some time to do it. I think the intent is there. So we, for example, get a lot of demand as I am. We get a lot of demand from uh, the Gulf region for, for solutions, primarily because I think uh, within the Middle East, um, the entire technology space isn't as mature as it is in, in say, India. So I think that's really the impact that we've seen. 
Well, I think it's also value for money for the services. I mean, the, the when I look at what firms are charging in Dubai, it's not that different from what they're charging in Hong Kong and Singapore. Yeah. They're charging developed world, first world country, developed uh, society prices. And I, like you said, that long tail that's underserved, I'm not sure that the entire society is ready for that kind of you know first world cost structure. But uh, but beyond that, to come back to something you were saying, I mean, a- a- anecdotally, um, you know, post Russia Ukraine conflict, I should say post, still ongoing, but anecdotally, from a relative who works for First Abu Dhabi National Bank, there is each day they're getting dozens of Russians, and this has been since last year, dozens of Russians coming to them to open up new bank accounts. Right. That's that's what the personal bankers, that's what the relationship managers are telling you. No, absolutely. And, and anecdotally also, not anecdotally, I think it's a very it's a very well researched and well documented fact. Until the Russia-Ukraine con- uh, conflict started, uh, Russians had a real preference for the UK for similar investments, especially London. If you, you know, if you, uh, there are documentaries upon documentaries about how if you go around London and uh, the posh parts of London, you will see most of the apartments and most of the, most of the uh, real estate has been bought over and is sitting completely empty, uh, even though the rentals are going, uh, you know, uh, completely off track. So I think, um, well, Belgravia, the Belgravia district is regarded as New Moscow. Exactly. Uh, my my former boss uh, doesn't care for it much anymore. I mean, and that's not to cast aspersions on the Russian emigres, but um, each neighborhood is known by the majority demographic, and for some, there's a perception that that all, all that Russian money is dirty money, and they want no part of it. No, absolutely. So I think that perception is now also, to some sense, has been extended to Dubai and to the UAE um, because of because of what we've just spoken about, where a lot of money is now going into the real estate and other and gold and other spaces in in the Middle East. Um, I in India, I have not heard at least at the government level or below there being too many concerns of that. Simply because I think the intent for a lot of the for a lot of the money that is going there is to is to move away from sanctioned countries and be a sustainable store of wealth um, in 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 the Middle East. I don't think they're trying to do much with it except for right now just keeping it in a holding pattern till the conflict gets over. So that is there. But then again, if you have a correspondent banking relationship with a bank or a financial institution and in the UAE, you are going to be concerned by, uh, you know, what are the compliance norms uh, that are getting followed? I mean, one of the big reasons why banks in smaller countries and countries that are not really um, that progressive when it comes to AML compliance norms, why they end up following progressive compliance norms is because they have a correspondent banking relationship sitting in a uh, sitting in a developed country or in a in a country which is very progressive as far as compliance norms are concerned. And the correspondent banking relationship team, uh, you know, effectively motivates the, the the other their correspondent banking relationship in the other country to follow those norms. So I think that some of that is definitely rubbing off there as well. That's interesting. Um, something else that we've discussed in the past is that that it is now easier to do wholesale monitoring of transactions and people in India. And this is evidenced by just the overall state of the technology, getting everyone in one database, things, innovations like the Aadhaar card. So if it's easier to do wholesale monitoring of people and transactions in India, right? Well, one is that because of technological innovation and just you know government policy that's determined, and two uh, implications for privacy. No, I think that's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think pointer that you've uh, that you've sort of 
talked about right now. So I think what has changed in India as far as why that has become easier is because just like governments across the world have taken the lead in creating infrastructure like highways or waterways or um, dams and others, I think what the Indian government has done differently is that it has created digital infrastructure, which is built on what we call uh, the jam trinity, which is jangan, which means accounts for the poorest of poor. Uh, A is for Aadhaar, which is the ID. Very important to know, uh, you know, what your identification is and a validated ID. Before this, um, you know, I remember a time that where you could have taken, I think, 12 to 16 different ID proofs to a bank, different types of ID proofs to a bank. And there was no way to validate whether that ID proof was was uh, fraudulent or not. So that is the second. And the third is mobile, which is mobile connectivity and others. So I think they built that stack. And on top of that stack, what is allowed is, uh, what is therefore allowed is for every person to be connected to an account, to have online transactions, to be connected to an ID. And you'll be, uh, you know, just like in many countries, not too many countries now, in India, verification APIs for your Aadhaar card, which is your ID, PAN card, which is your tax or, or uh, account verification ID and others is actually provided by the government of India to different startups and different companies. So you have an API that goes out and validates all of this. And I think that's that entire construct and structure and infrastructure that has been created by the government mm -hmm. has allowed monitoring of transactions uh, in a better manner. Now, when it comes to data privacy, yeah, I think uh, that is an interesting question because one... It, some say it's a control grid. No, I mean, it. it, it see, there has been a sea change in the way pe governments have started looking at data. Right. Until about, you know, there was this, there was this very uh, uh, interesting saying that um, the, which, which used to compare um, the US, India and China and their outlook to data. And so the, the, the saying was that in the US, um, the, the government considers uh, your data to be your property. In China, the government considers the, the, uh, the citizens' data to be the collective property of the country. Mm -hmm. And in India, the government considers the uh, person data to be no one's property. That was the joke that we would that we would make because it was just let it was just given out for free to everyone. That's massively changed. Where there's now data localization, you have to now sort of process data here. But that being said, yeah, I think I think when it comes to privacy, uh, there is still more to be done. There is in fact a very big law that is waiting to be passed in Parliament on data privacy and data protection. Uh, we are all awaiting that right now because that's going to have massive ramifications on penalties on on you know what is it can be put out in public domain what can't be how do end, how do private organizations need to protect their data banks and financial institutions are already covered by some of those but now many intermediaries in the middle need to be covered so i think it's a developing story to be honest we the country could do far better uh, hopefully we'll see changes in the next 2 to 3 years once the regulations are out I know I talk about the downside, but I think certainly one of the benefits has been for years we've heard the IMF, the Financial Stability Board, and others talk about financial inclusion, the world's great unbanked. I'd say that that's been really one of the India's success stories, right. yeah, banking services to most of its people, irrespective of their means. Um, but it does it does weigh on the system. It, it's a built-in inefficiency. It does weigh on the system. And uh, I, I don't know if that's necessarily going to continue, but it'd be politically untenable for the foreseeable future to, to, to change that. So you also point out that for financial institutions, AML is just one use case. And there are other use cases, such as, you know, screening systems for due diligence and data asset development. Could you could, could you flesh that out, please? Sure. So I'd like to call that, um, you know, a movement, a progressive movement that is happening from KYC to KYX. 
So, um, so when I when we talk about KYX, it's a little bit like uh, you know our algebra classes in school where X could stand for anything. Right. And solve for yeah. X. Exactly, solve for X. So yeah. X here could be third party vendor, employee, investor. You know, you could put any any alphabet there. And I think what's happened is that KYC is a very know your customer means identifying who your customer is and, and figuring out the risk. I think the same technologies and capabilities are now uh, being applied to other third parties, including even employees. I was, for example, told recently that um, large technology providers, outsourcers, when they send their employees to the US or to UK or, or Canada or other places on secondment, mm -hmm. uh, they are now expected to check their sanctions, peps, and adverse news on a daily basis for all employees who've gone there. That's, uh, that's a big deal. It's a pretty onerous task. Exactly. But, but the reason for that is because the financial institutions on the other side or other institutions on the other side have mandates to ensure that the wrong kind of person or a, or a person who is maybe implicated in something negative isn't sort of sitting in there on their roles. So KYE, know your employee, is now following similar norms. Similarly, you have know your investor, investee. We have, for example, a number of venture capital and private equity firms who are now our customers who want to constantly keep checking their portfolio companies, their key management and others to make sure that there are no uh, you know, potential risks associated with them by using the same screening transaction monitoring technologies and others. So when we talk about banks, right. banks are no longer just concerned about AML. They're concerned about other risks. They're worried about litigation, tax, blacklists, exclusion lists. They're worried about, uh, you know, a particular potential party being on, say, you know, a local uh, regulatory uh, blacklist and others. And they're checking for those. And I think that's a big transformation that we are seeing where there was a time when you were only checking politically exposed person peps, global sanctions, adverse media, and maybe one odd list. That was what was being checked in banks. Now we have requirements coming in from banks and financial institutions where they want to check close to about 200 lists for each and every entity. Um, and that's moving from KYC to KYX. Okay, that, that's an important point. So coming back to what you were saying earlier about India mm -hmm. has the highest number, the third highest number of governmental actions against AML violators. India, you say, also has the largest concentration of AML and financial crime professionals in the world after the US. I'm surprised because I know ACAMS for the longest time has been touting their institution in China. Right, uh, the relationship with one of the Indian universities. Don't quote me on this. It might be Tsinghua, uh, known for their law school. Um, but the plan was at the start of the dec last decade to have X number of financial crime professionals trained. Um, how did India attain that such a high number of financial crime professionals? Sure. Uh, when did it happen? How did it happen? Is it just a matter of everyone's jumping on the bandwagon and taking the ICA diploma or ACAMS or ACFS or yeah. the, the whole credentialing arms race? Sure. I think um, uh, let's break that question down into a couple of parts. Let's start with, I think, the credentials, ACAMS, ACFCS, and others. For the average Indian professional, uh, those um, credentials and those certifications are quite expensive. Correct. So most, unless you're uh, sponsored. Unless you're sponsored and most organizations will not sponsor because unlike, say, in the U.S., where the average AML expert uh, or AML analyst will make, say, fifty to $80,000 to begin with. So on a salary of fifty to $80,000 to empower them, if you give, if you give them a certification of 2000 to $2,500, that is not, uh, you know, sort of a big deal, but uh, relatively. But, you know, the if you are starting as an analyst in India and you're making, annually you're making, uh, let's say, between seven and $12,000 annually, right. uh, you know, 
an organization is going to balk at the po- at the p- prospect of uh, certifying them for two thousand two thousand five hundred dollars on top of that, uh, because as a proportion of their salary, it just doesn't uh, uh, you know doesn't really mean much. In fact, one of the recommendations that I had to the folks at ACAMS and ACFCS was that you should tie up with some of the local banks and uh, convert it into a uh, you know almost like a BNPL certification. Buy now, pay later. You can keep paying. Right. Correct. Over a twenty-four month period, and you'll see that because the issue is not so much the price, the cost of it. The issue is um, the cash flow that it sort of blocks up for most professionals, because most professionals just don't get uh, you know the opportunity to do that. So I think you don't see too many ACFCS and ACAMs. You get you see a lot in India, but you don't see as a proportion to the total number of professionals. There are very small percentage. Now, why did this happen? That you have so many professionals. Number one reason is. As I mentioned, for any business, what the focus is either to increase revenue or reduce cost. Risk and regulation is all about reducing cost. Uh, it was and has always been a very person-heavy endeavor to kind of manage AML regulation and compliances. So one of the first set of things that started getting outsourced was AML compliance, screening, remediation, transaction monitoring, a lot of that alerts. And so if you look at the financial institutions in the US, uh, so North America, uh, uh, you know, Europe and others, what did you need? You needed a uh, skilled, technologically skilled set of people. You need people who have good research and you need them to be good at English um, and you needed outsourcing centers. And that was already sort of established in, in India. So it was a, so all you needed to do was to sort of train them in the operational aspects of AML. So in fact, most of the AML professionals that you end up meeting in India, they're not AML as sort of subject matter experts. They're not contextually AML experts. They're more operational AML professionals, which means they'll know how to remediate alerts. They'll know how to look at alerts. They'll know how to do investigation. They'll know how to do uh, transaction monitoring alert disambiguation. And that's now gone into theoretically, uh, potentially, we've not, there's no real study being done, but we estimate it to be a few hundred thousand individuals just sitting out of India whose job is KYC, documentation, onboarding, AML, risk, remediation, transaction monitoring, that entire end went sort of gamut. I have a contact in Singapore whose position has remained unchanged for over decades, which is that over time, you're going to see more data scientists at the helm of AML FCC teams uh, because I think, as you've shared with me, AML FCC requires more data science people for operational purposes, but that doesn't mean the AML experience and knowledge is useless, that you'll continue to see them being led by people with on the ground AML yes. financial crime experience and knowledge. But my friend's position is this. Over time, it's more about handling vast troves of data discerning patterns, themes, trends from that data, and that accordingly, over time, actual substantive knowledge of AML will matter less. So what does this mean? I mean, it means that perhaps more automate with more automation, because that, that's the subtext of this, that, that's not fully uh, addressed, with more automation, you you are going to see more junior level uh, MLROs uh, replace more more people at the lower tier and, and and even middle management. That that can hollow out a team, unfortunately. Um, then one day your algorithm works until it doesn't, and that Iran sanctions violation transaction slips through the net. And then that's an awkward conversation to have with regulators because they'll say you were too greedy, you were too nearsighted, you were you know myopic, you went too far in the direction of cost cutting. And had you had more human eyes on that transaction, there's a good chance someone might have picked it up. So both are compelling. Both, I mean, there are arguments to be made on both sides. But can you tell me why you believe the AML knowledge and experience is still important? Sure. So I'm actually taking a leaf out of other 
sectors and areas that have seen massive transformation because of the use of technology. Right. And a couple of things happen. First of all, um, the need for technology enabled resources and understanding uh, increases exponentially in the beginning because you're trying to make capital investments, you're trying to make implementations, you're trying to build uh, you know, solutions and other things. And I think that's the space that we are at. Uh, that's just on a side note, that's generally a net positive for India because we produce uh, as a country, we, I think we produce, end up producing uh, a massive number of uh, statistics and mathematics majors, which, have, which are now in massive demand for not just AML, but for many other use cases. Now, what happens when, when many of these implementations happen uh, or these big transformations happen is that the... Uh, you know, the skill, if you look at the band of skills for any area, they go from highly skilled to low skill. And in digital transformation, what happens is there's massive um, changes and upheaval that happens in the big fat center of that skill ecosystem. So what that means is those at the lower end get pushed further lower end. Those at the higher end get pushed further high end. Those at the middle have to either move towards the, the lower end or the higher end or just get sort of pushed out completely. Or, because, they, or they upskill and run themselves through, yeah, through the value uh, chain. Which is, exact, which is where they would then get moved to the, the upper end of that spectrum. Right? I mean, we've seen that now with aviation. We've seen that with, uh, with manufacturing. We have now seen that with, uh, you know, with with, uh, with a number of regulated organizations, lawyers and others, where every time there's a disintermediation that happens because of technology, uh, the entire spectrum gets pushed. The, the ones at the lower level get pushed further lower, the ones at the higher level get pushed further higher. And I think while I would agree with your friends on a certain sort of aspects, I definitely see that... Oh, he's Jackie. He's a finance yeah. Jackie guy, so he's always looking for room to cut. Yeah. And yeah. so I think, and I think, so what's going to happen is there's definitely going to be cuts. I mean, that's the reason why you're going to bring in again, I'm going to go back to the fact that when you talk about AML and compliance and others, we should be under no um, disillusionment about the fact that, that the purpose of the business is going to be trying to try and reduce that cost to the extent possible. Uh, right. And so machine learning and data science that is coming in right now is going to pri the primary driver is going to be to try and reduce or bring in control costs over a longer period of time. It's going to lead to higher costs right now because there are going to be CapEx investments, which are going to get amortized over a period of time, but it's going to lead to overall transaction. The transaction level is going to lead to lower costs, but it's going to be led by, in my opinion, it's going to be led by AML experts because Machine learning or technology is just like anything. It's it's like handing, uh, you know, a, a chef the best Swiss knife in the world. Right? It, it doesn't make a difference if uh, it, how good the knife is. It what matters is how good the chef is. Right? Uh, so the same thing is going to happen, I think, in the AML space where we will have high-end AML experts under whose supervision many of these technologies are going to run. Or another example might be you might give someone. The best training in the world, the finest ingredients, uh, lay out the step by step the recipe in front of them. But as, as we can see, you put multiple chefs in the same room, and okay, as, even assuming they're following the same protocols, you can end up with vastly different results and quality across, across the board. Absolutely. Yeah. So Dunn and Bradstreet, which is a company you worked with, is one of the oldest data companies in the world. They've long had a presence in India. And as you pointed out to me, machines require high quality data or else it leads to poor output and poor decision making. And that's mission critical because we're talking about a highly regulated space, financial services. Right. So the, the data has to be top notch. And the decision making has to be spot on. Can you see then instances where automation done poorly almost always leads to poor results? Are there institutions in India that are not being served by the automation they've done, and that they need to re revamp it? They need to customize it. Or, you know, they, 
perhaps they need to come to someone like you. Yeah, I think uh, there are pockets of inefficiencies in automation in almost every organization that I know of. I mean, it's not, some have more pockets, some have lesser, and almost always uh, the main driver for that inefficiency is when um, you know you you end up creating a technology or you end up creating automation that doesn't serve an actual on-ground purpose adequately. So you end up, you know, you end up investing in algorithms and machine learning and data science and all these buzzwords that are great at the board level, right. but because there is limited either engineering culture within an organization, which until recently, most organizations did not have. Most organizations in the financial space, most organizations most average organizations in the world did not have a technology department or have a senior technology member sitting on the board or advising the board. And so, uh, so the, the challenge often happens is that at the board level, um, there's suddenly the need to want to do something in automation, something in engineering, because, uh, you know, often it is as simple as uh, them feeling a sense of FOMO. Yeah. And then, exactly. And then, then what ends up happening is they'll they'll put in a certain amount of investment, they'll build a committee, they'll go out and try and solve a problem, but there's no engineering culture internally. And when there's no engineering culture, uh, the probability of getting it wrong is, is, is high. So I'd say uh, this is an experience that almost every organization has had. Some, with, some have had worse experiences than others in certain pockets. And the differentiator in more cases is do you have engineering culture? Do you have engineering leadership? Do you have technology leadership ingrained in your organization? Or have you outsourced it completely? I think building an engineering in, uh, culture and, and sort of leadership is very important if you have to sort of build those internally. Right. Now, this is exactly the point. Um, because to your point about buzzwords, there are a lot of people who are buzzword compliant, but they're repackaging the knowledge and experiences of others and right. not writing as experts. Oftentimes, there are very few techies amongst them. There Absolutely. Are, there are many people who have knowledge of anti-money laundering rules and regs and protocols and procedures. But how many of them can say they were like our inaugural guest, Bill Miker, who is an undercover operative, and he knew about money laundering. He knew about the weak points in the financial system. Because he did money laundering. Obviously, he was an undercover agent, so he had to, because his life was in je jeopardy. But there are very few people of that kind of experience, because anti-money laundering is not necessarily the reverse side of the coin of money laundering. Right. So there are a lot of buzzword compliant people. There are a lot of non-techies. There are a lot of people with, without on-the-ground experience. And they're masquerading as experts. And, and as far as that engineering talent, the emphasis on engineering talent, building those teams, the, this has come up with Hogan Lovells, the law firm. Right. Because they recently set up, and other law firms have done this too, subsidiaries that are built up of interdisciplinary teams of engineers, AI experts, and lawyers. And the question I, I have again is how many how many real techies do you have? What is the experience right. of these AI experts? Um, well, absolutely. I think uh, just to add to that, I mean, if you look at the consulting world, the consulting world did very well in the 90s, early 2000s. And I think... Uh, while they've done very well even right now, they continue to be to be leaders and thought leaders and, and great implementation specialists and, you know, uh, across the world. I, I myself used to be part of them. I think maybe where they've missed a beat sometimes is doing core technology development and core technology work. And the reason for that often is that if you look at the the, the top player of big, the big four professional services firms or the consulting firms, their partners and senior leaders are almost always chartered accountants or, or business management um, kind of graduates and others. But they've got very few core engineers and very few technologists. Um, and I think the exact same problem is there even with other organizations. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, 
And so we come to AI finally. And as you pointed out to me that until there's adequate regulation, AI will not be used for important decision-making in ML and financial crime compliance. Why is that? So when it comes to AI, artificial intelligence, which, uh, you know, if you were to get into the technical space would be slightly different, if not a subset of machine learning, is because AI suffers often from um, a lack of explainability and auditability and often uh, what we call black box logics. So what happens is that if I put in 10 inputs into a black box and I get one output, but I don't know how those five got transformed into one, uh, even if the answer is correct, even if the answer is correct, the challenge then becomes is I can't explain to a regulator as an AML professional, I can't explain to a regulator why a certain alert came or why a certain uh, transaction was flagged off as, as high risk or not, or why a certain diligence was... Are you, are you alluding to false positives? I'm, I'm alluding to the fact that why an alert came out in today's date, if you look at transaction monitoring system, they're based on an explainable algorithm, which has weightages. I can explain it to a regulator and they can agree and disagree with me. We can audit it. We can go back and figure out why an alert came. But with artificial intelligence, just like ChatGPT, which is a great example of artificial intelligence and large language models, it, nobody at OpenAI or ChatGPT can explain can you know confidently tell you when you when you put in an answer when you put in a question why it gave you the answer it gave you there is no way to sort of identify why what that methodology was so i think that is a big issue the black box approach the black box nature of artificial intelligence is one second is auditability auditability means i can go back and go to every single step of the process and i can take a regulator or i can take a auditor or i can take my, my board or others through the logic that was applied by the machine to come to an output, which could be an alert, which could be, uh, you know, it, it could be a, a red flag. It could be an, a decision taken on, on onboarding. But you, could, you, but you could do that in the old days with the paper trail because you had the suspicious activity, the suspicious transaction reports. And if you were good at your job, you were able to articulate your suspicion. Exactly. So there was that so, paper trail. Exactly. I mean, paper, the paper trail is the, the the logic of the paper trail is that I can logically tell you step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and why I came to the outcome that I did. Right. The problem with AI is that the five steps in the middle are all are often very hazy. So uh, that is the problem. So that's auditability. And third is reproducibility. Can a system reproduce the same results over and over again, exactly the same way, given the exact same conditions? If you, for example, went to chat GPT today or large language model today, you answered them a question, you know, asked them a question uh, and it gave you a certain answer and you went back after five days, it may give you a different answer or it give you, may give you a different answer. That is a problem of reproducibility, right? So because of black box logic, lack of auditability, lack of reproducibility at the regulatory level and therefore in the court of law, it is very difficult to be able to justify why a certain step was taken. And so I think while artificial intelligence is already getting used in the space of AML, it is not being used for decision making. It is used as a way of assistance, assistance to decision making. I think it will continue to push those norms and boundaries to the time we don't have regulation at the, at the global level or at the, at the national level uh, for any country on what AI systems are, what are the best practices for building them, how do you ensure auditability, how do you ensure track traceability, so on and so forth. So it's going to take some time. I know even China is telling its corporates to not plug in proprietary data into generative IP, I'm sorry, generative AI platforms like ChatGPT, uh, that you should stay away from ChatGPT when it comes to discovery. Right. And that many vendors say that, you know, the, 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 because AI for a time became an in, it became a, a draw, it became a marketing tool. Yeah. And so many of them would say in their pictures, AI is at the core of what we offer. Yeah. And as you pointed out, it's leading to pushback from customers. They don't want AI. Or at least they don't want it in its current form. And I'm, I'm wondering, is this 
I don't know. Are people being Luddites? Uh, are they being, you know, backward? Are they, they, you know, putting their foot down against further adoption, adoption of this technology because they fear they're going to be laid off? Or um, there, there are genuine concerns about the state of technology as mm -hmm. it exists. Right. And, you know, privacy and data security is not is not assured. It's it's not guaranteed. Um, is is that why there is pushback? I think it's a mix of those reasons that you pointed out. Um, one major reason is, of course, is regulatory acceptance. If I onboard a screening system, or if I onboard a transaction monitoring system, or a transaction screening system, or a KYC system, um, or or a, or a reporting system, and if I decide to spend in the millions of dollars to sort of or a, or a few hundred thousand dollars to sort of implement it and then train other people. Uh, how do I know that a regulator is not going to come down three months later and, and slap me on the wrist and tell me that that my system is incorrect because it has AI in the middle of it and they there are those problems that we just spoke about right now that, that continue to exist. So that's one. Uh, the second is that um, even when, uh, when businesses want to onboard something, they also want to have some explainability of how that thing works. And I think um, sales guys and marketing guys are good at um, maybe pushing AI and machine learning they're, at the they're good at they're good at selling you tomorrow. They're not so good at solving the problems of today. Right. Yeah. And I think so that continues. So I think there's a big gap between that. There's just two. And third is there's something that I've often told people. What's that? That we are in the business of uh, being technologically progressive, but functionally conservative. Uh, dealing with fundamentally conservative clients, the, and, and it's a it's a risk area. It's it's a little bit by, like being a doctor, right? I mean, you would when you go to a doctor because you've got a problem. There is a risk. There's an issue. You don't go to the you only go to the doctor because of their experience, because of their background, because of the skill set, because of their qualifications. Um, and but when you go there, you want to make sure that they have the most progressive access to technology, the most progressive access to um, to to uh, to medicines and others. So they are functionally conservative in terms of the fact that they're very structured upbringings. They've, they've sort of gone through the entire rigmarole. They've done their 20, 25 years as, you know, as doctors. They've specialized in a certain area uh, so that you can trust them. Uh, but technologically, you want them to be progressive. And I think risk, AML, compliance, financial crimes is a little bit like that. And so if you go, you know, if you if you if you sort of rush through the barn doors with by sort of waving AI and machine learning and any new buzzword um, to begin with, that sometimes is very disconcerting to buyers uh, because they're looking for solid conservative uh, partners who are progressive as far as technology is concerned. Um, and so I think that's, that's really, well, that's, I think is a marketing issue. It's a, it's a more sales issue that I see with a lot of, especially with a lot of startups end up doing. Um, I think the more established players have figured it out. So if you look at all the major established players like Moody's and Dow Jones and, um, and, and world check and, and Refinitiv and others, uh, you will hardly see them leading with AI and machine learning. They're very conservative in their, in, in, in how they sort of approach this because they've, they've understood that about their clients. I've, I mean, I, as you know, I used to be with Thompson Reuters Financial and Risk Division, which was then sold on and renamed uh, Refinitiv and sold on to the Blackstone Group and then to the London Stock Exchange. I do feel it gutted their capabilities. And um, there are firms that, I mean, look, I'm going to, let me put it this way. All the big four will tell you they do AML and mm -hmm. anti-graph services or jurisdiction. That does not mean they're all equally good at what they do. In the US, for example, when I was there as a student, 06, KPMG was the go-to firm for AML, Celtic services. You came over this region, it was KPMG, maybe followed by followed by PwC, but the top dog was Deloitte. Right. But, but you notice how the move of one person 
or one person's deputy to set up a new practice can cause an upheaval in the market. And yeah, I mean, the, from a client perspective, I mean, you don't want to be subject to those vagaries of, you know, the person you know and you trust leaving, taking that expertise with them. Right. Good chance, you know, as with lawyers, the chance you, you may well end up following that person to their new firm. Absolutely. I think uh, you, you're absolutely right. When it comes to, I think, advisors and consultants, that is definitely uh, an issue. And I think what has happened, at least uh, in some of the countries that I've been exposed to um, when it comes to these big consultants and advisory firms, right. is that because they want to make sure that their business is not dependent on one person or on one deputy or one sort of senior partner, um, those firms have become larger than the people that are there. But I think in what it, it has also done is that they've also become their positioning has become very generalist in nature. So, for example, today, uh, you cannot, one cannot definitively say which of the big four are best at AML. It's, you know, you couldn't even say that in a country. Everybody has a very different view of which one do they think is better than the other. And the reason is because their, their positioning has also changed. So I think it's more of a positioning issue. They themselves, the partners and senior Professionals and others are very good. They're, they're, they're great at what they do. They've got some, you know, some of the best experience. In fact, we ourselves at Zygram, we partner with a number of these big four firms and they do a great job. But I think they're definitely positioning has sort of become more generalist rather than more specific to some of these, some of these areas that you've spoken about over progressively over a period of time. And the desire to, for law firms to create these new AI tech subsidiaries like Hogan Levels or others. Right. Is this in part done so that one, they're competing with the consulting firms. Um, people don't normally go to law firms for business advice. They're competing with the consulting firms. Now, part of that may be they don't want to have to give out a lot of that business to consulting firms. They want to do that in-house. Uh, but the question then becomes, do you still have legal privilege if you're the subsidiary of a law firm? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, there are many, not just technical questions, there are also some very uh, large philosophical questions that, that are at play. For example, you know, you've got robo lawyers in the US and let's say a robo lawyer gives you the wrong advice as a, and, and, and the robo lawyer company is owned by another law firm and gives you the wrong advice which is factually incorrect. Can you sue that law firm for malpractice, right? Because because the artificial intelligence model gave you the wrong advice, um, and is artificial intelligence akin to like a person's intelligence? If artificial intelligence is sort of black box thinking, can can someone take complete liability over the decisions and the outputs of that? There are many of these questions that are there. I think the challenge that is there often with law firms that they're trying to solve is the fact that that uh, for a number of law firms in the world, not the top tier ones, but as you go below, their per hour billings are under pressure. Correct. Because customers, there was a time when you went, there were a limited number of high quality law firms. You went there, you valued the advice that they gave you because you didn't have access to information on your own. They would sit with you, you you'd spend, you know, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars every hour of their advice and effort, and they give you great quality advice, and they did that. But I think now, uh, as you move in the spectrum, and again, this is again to the question of disintermediation of the middle, what happens is as you st they, st they started attacking the middle. So we're talking about uh, law firms who charge 100 to 200, 300 dollars an hour. Their uh, customers are now demanding fixed, uh, you know, fixed fee. Uh, engagements. They're demanding fixed fee consulting and engagements and others. And so I think their artificial intelligence is going to play a certain role. And I think that's that's really where they're investing in that. It's a mix again of FOMO and, and the fact that there are no cost pressures on, on the kind of billing that many of these firms have to do. And the only way they can maintain their profitability and their margin stickiness with the customers is by involving technology, something that they've not really done. Though I have my doubts on this simply because as a lawyers and law firms uh, have traditionally not been great adopters of technology. 
uh, they've just not known, known to be great adopters. One of our earliest guests even pointed out that there's um, a high degree of technophobia in the yeah. world, and that what what was good for them since 1600 is good for them today. Mm -hmm. you know, that they'd rather just carry on with yesterday's forms and jargon. And, uh, I, and assume society will continue to pay them an easy living thereafter. Yeah. I know, for example, senior lawyers who can who don't know how to use Excel. Simple. Wow. Well, we're talking about partners of a different generation, than really, right? No, I'm not talking about a very different generation. I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, partners who are now maybe maybe mid forties. Uh, early 40s who will just children children of the 80s and they never so they were young when the graphical user interface was being yes. released and yet somehow they never bothered to they would have used it but you see in the in the 20 25 years that they've had to practice they've never had to use excel there's always some 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 secretary somebody else sort of doing calculations for them when they send out an invoice it's it's a word document they're very comfortable with word uh, yeah. Most 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 partners, most lawyers I know don't make presentations on PowerPoint. They just don't do that. So many of those issues are there. Yeah. So um, those are all the questions I had for you. In the time we've got left, is there anything you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, is there anything you feel we didn't discuss? I mean, bearing in mind we are part of a university, and you know we 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 do you know we are part of a law school and. Um, we do have a lot of students watching too. Sure. So from the standpoint of career advice in this space or, or um, making themselves more, um, more equipped as lawyers, as compliance officers, uh, you know, raising their own level of tech savviness, what, 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 what advice would you give them? Um, I'd say one is, uh, definitely, if you're looking at choosing this as a space, financial crime, anti-money laundering, yeah. compliance, is to have contextual knowledge. And what that means is go through documentaries, read news articles, contextually understand the real implications of money laundering uh, you know, in a country across the world, uh, because that will give you that that will really power your understanding at the at the micro level when you understand the macro level. I think a lot not, of people not, not just not just the rules, not just the rules. I'm saying the macro levels understand the economics of money laundering. Very, very important because money laundering is not there happens or any crime happens because there is an economic reason, uh, especially money laundering happens because there's an economic reason to a large extent. So that, that's one. Uh, number two is in the technology era. If possible, if you're still in college um, and you're still sort of undergrad or doing, um, you, know, you know, sort of good doing a graduate degree, learn a, a learn a scripting language. Uh, it you may not use it going forward. Uh, you may not, uh, you know, you may not want to become an engineer, but it'll open your mind to how technology works. So I think uh, if you can do that, courses available for free. You should go out and do that. That's number two. Um, third is do not disregard um new areas of technology like machine learning ai and large language models they are going to be around for a long long time and anybody who is passing out right now from college is going to feel the real impact of it uh because by the time you know you're five years or six years or seven years into your career things would have changed massively um so i think those are those are the two top two three things i would say to students well, it's interesting because we see more people studying python a yeah. very age group. So, so Absolutely. Some, people, some people are definitely preparing for the future. Abhishek Bali, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ajay. And to our viewers and listeners, thank you again. Until next time.